Here on Mad Props Arrow, we spend a lot of time talking about rules and regulations and the reference books that help us stay in the good graces of the FAA. And there's a reason we do that. When I was a young instructor, the first person I ever signed off for a private pilot certificate was a guy who had owned and flown an airplane for 20 years. He just never got a pilot certificate. Eventually, his friends at the airport made it clear to him, if you don't get a certificate, we're going to turn you in. That made it worthwhile for him to take some time off, come to Florida for a few weeks, fly with me, and get his certificate. So he could go home and fly his airplane and be perfectly legal because the cost for running outside the rules of the FAA can be much more pricey and much more painful than most people realize. There have been a couple interesting news stories recently that illustrate this really well and I think it's worth passing them along to you because you probably never heard of these and they're not all that isolated. One of them involves a retired airline pilot in Oklahoma in 2022 flying a Stearman with a passenger on a beautiful day having a sightseeing flight. Basically, they went out and they were just having a terrific time and the pilot decided he would get low and fly around this lakefront and do what he called water dancing. Now, eventually, they hit some wires. They ended up in the water. The aircraft was severely damaged. Luckily, nobody was really all that injured, but the pilot reported this as the engine failed. It sputtered, it lost power, and I had no choice but to go in the water and we hit wires on the way. Gee, there was just nothing I could do. Unfortunately for him, when there is an accident like this, there is an investigation. And they do talk to the pilot, but they talk to everyone else they can find that had anything to do with this. In this case, including the passenger. Over the course of the investigation, the passenger's story didn't really match up with the pilot's story. She said that he was flying low intentionally, that he had done that on purpose. And she noticed that although he said they were at 900 feet descending to 500 feet when the accident happened, she said the power lines were roughly at the same altitude they were as they were flying over the lake. She also said that once they were recovered from the crashed aircraft, the pilot was complaining about this was going to be a big problem because that's a $200,000 airplane and the only way the insurance would cover them is if he reported that the engine failed, although she said the engine was running fine. Part of the investigation led the NTSB to look at the ADSB returns and they found that those agreed much more closely with the passenger's account of the crash than with the pilot's. Things start getting dicey at that point. That NTSB investigation led to a grand jury who found the pilot had made a false report saying he had lost an engine when in fact he was just stunting around. He had created the conditions for the accident. It wasn't something that just happened to befall him. This is where we really should pay attention as pilots and get our integrity intact. Just that obstruction charge, the fact that he had misled the investigators, that alone is good for five years in jail and a $250,000 fine. And that's with the loss of the aircraft. And while this isn't part of the news story, I suspect if we look deeper into this, we'd find the insurance company, once they could follow the NTSB investigation and find this wasn't an accident as it was portrayed by the pilot, it's entirely possible the insurance company is not covering that accident, which means you did lose a $200,000 airplane and a possible $250,000 fine and up to five years in jail. That's a steep price to pay for just not accepting I screwed up. Because if he had just said, yeah, I screwed up, sure, the insurance company may not have paid off, but the NTSB would not have been seeking out a grand jury because of an obstruction charge. Another example that we should all be paying attention to comes from Alaska in 2022. A 63 year old man owned a Super Cub, a PA-18. He was flying it without a pilot certificate and he had made numerous modifications to the airplane that weren't approved. The pilot, who wasn't really a pilot, just an aircraft owner who was flying an airplane, tried to get around the issue of the unauthorized modifications by putting two-inch letters on the aircraft that said experimental, implying that this aircraft was an experimental home-built aircraft. Unfortunately, that wasn't true. 
it was a normal category airplane with a standard category airworthiness certificate. This is called fraud. This became a problem when the owner of the aircraft at the controls by himself took off out of a private strip and lost power at about 100 feet. The landing that resulted caused a considerable amount of damage to the airplane, which means there's an investigation. Once the investigation got underway and they realized the owner of the aircraft was flying it and didn't have a pilot certificate and that the airplane was fraudulently marked as an experimental when it was in fact a standard airworthiness certificate, now we have a whole new problem, don't we? The owner of that aircraft, the person who was at the controls, remains in federal custody today awaiting sentencing on August 7th, 2024. What's and his future may include several years in jail and substantial six-figure fines. He also has to pay restitution for the hangar his aircraft hit and damaged. All these are good examples of why it's really important to actually know what the rules are and follow them. It's not that tough. There are many times where we don't know the answer to our question, but as Pat Brown always tells us, there's a Federal Aviation Regulation book. There are a whole variety of books, reference materials, that we can go to to find out what is legal, how should I be conducting myself, what am I required to do to pursue the activity I have planned. Look, we're always going to have questions. There's always going to be some hoops to jump through, but it really is worth taking the time to make the phone call, send the email, talk to somebody with greater experience, and make sure we're on the up and up. Because while the insurance company may deny our claim because we didn't get our annual done or we didn't have our flight review done, that's a problem to us financially. But if we fraudulently label the aircraft as registered when it's not, if we fly the aircraft as if we're certificated and have the privilege of doing that when we don't, you're into a whole new realm of trouble now. And if something goes wrong and an investigation ensues or people decide to make a phone call about you just as that student I had many years ago did, you could have a real problem on your hands. Take our advice if you would. Take the FAA's advice and the NTSB's advice and your lawyer's advice and just follow the rules. Life is much easier if you stay within the lines that the FAA has sketched out for us. If you do, you can have a great flying career, whether it's a hobby or a vocation, or you could have a really bad day. Hey, thanks for being here. Thanks for listening to this story. I hope it gives you some insight into why it's so important to follow the rules and why Pat Brown and I are such sticklers for looking up the reference material whenever we've got a question. I hope you'll click the like button down below. Comment on this. Tell us your story. Have you seen something like this happen in your area? Heaven forbid it happened to you. And of course, subscribe to the channel because we just love having you here.